Welcome. This is Watchman Privacy. I'm Gabriel Custodiate. If you like this listener-supported show and you want it to succeed and improve, please consider supporting it through one of the methods listed at watchmanprivacy.com. I have a privacy guide sold on Amazon, courses, and consulting. Free methods of supporting includes leaving positive reviews, subscribing to me wherever you can, Twitter, YouTube, Odyssey, etc., and sharing my work. Find links in the description or at watchmanprivacy.com. Your support determines the future of this show. Thank you. Welcome to the Watchman Privacy Podcast. I'm Gabriel Custodiate. I'm very pleased to be joined by the first three-time guest on the show. This is Mr. Giant Pandari. He is a astute cultural analyst. I would call him a philosopher. And as his day job, he is a junior minor analyst and an advisor to institutions, various institutions. Uh, Mr. Bandari, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm very well, Gabriel. Thanks uh, for inviting me again. Oh, it's definitely my pleasure. And I would encourage the listeners to go back and check out the first episode, 46, and the second episode, 77. I've kind of done them in a way that we're building on top of each other. But if you listen to this one by itself, no problem. I think you'll get a lot out of it. But you'll also get a better introduction to his fundamental ideas if you go back in time. Now, traditionally, Mr. Bandari, I start off with a couple of um, common uh, critiques of your uh, your your view on third world cultures or or Western culture. And I want to start this time by referencing a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. And I'm sure you know these kind of books. The argument is simply that Western ideas are not anything particularly special in and of themselves. It is a geographic coincidence that allowed, excuse me, the West to rise before anyone else. Immunological advantages that help them progress and conquer They developed writing as a matter of necessity, not because there was something inherent in them to do so. In other words, we don't need to get to the so-called Western ideas to explain how the West came to dominate. We need only look at basic material facts. What do you make of this kind of argument and similar arguments? Well, Jared Diamond, and I I have read his books, uh, Jared Diamond has spent a fair bit of his time in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and I'm actually quite surprised that he could not see the differences between uh, people of Papua New Guinea and people in West Europe. Uh, I mean, this really requires a special kind of ignorance to ignore what is very starkly in front of you. You know, cultures are different. People are very different. Europeans of the past understood this thing very well. Now, it is not that Europeans arrived in Africa or the Indian subcontinent or to Americas and suddenly realized that they wanted to be racist. Uh, race, the concept of racism is a, div, uh, is a concept that came into the mind much later in life. These people, these European colonizers understood that people are different and it is virtually impossible to change people, uh, even through education and indoctrination. Uh, And my guess, uh, Gabriel, is, and I'm not saying I I have read enough about it because there's a lot of uh, political correctness uh, around this subject, but my guess is that European missionaries came to a conclusion at some point of time that some babies had to be removed from their parents and put in care of, uh, of the missionaries from very early in life to ensure that magical thinking did not get imparted to these babies. Once you get magical thinking imparted to people, it is absolutely impossible, virtually impossible to erase that. And Gabriel, I'm saying this from a a bit of experience myself. I grew up in a very rational uh, family, but even then, because I grew up in a society that is that thinks in magical uh, ways, uh, it took me decades to work on my mind and uh, try to uh, make it my mind more rational. So uh, uh, I think people are very different. And what we have also realized over centuries, uh, look at Romas in East Europe, even after a thousand years, they haven't really got assimilated They haven't really got changed. Uh, And it takes a long, long time to change people uh, culturally. Uh, And I would give uh, that change at least a millennia, if not two or three. It's also ironic that 
Mr. Diamond is using reason to argue that reason is not the main thing that propels the West. He has a he has a pretty you know compelling argument for for what it is, and this kind of tactic of using using reason against reason is something that the critical theorists have done, the deconstructionists. It's it's a little bit perverse, uh, to be perfectly honest. So so uh, uh, Gabriel, the thing is that um, you know the more I read about uh, the last two or three hundred years of history, I realize that. Uh, development of science, uh, which was a great achievement, at, and science is a great tool, also brought in place a kind of simplistic thinking in which we no longer see science as the tool. We now see science as a religion. Um, and we want to break everything down into something very simplistic without the interactions between, uh, you know, the, life is very complex. There is interaction between so many things that happen. Uh, but what I have seen with uh, Jared Diamond, and I really liked the book, I have to say, at, at a certain point, at, from a point of view, it is actually very uh, interesting book to read. And I uh, found it very enlightening at one stage of my life. Uh, but this is these kind of books are consequences of simplistic thinking in which you think that you can mechanistically break down uh, philosophy into mathematical uh, equations or, you know, 10 uh, uh, apps kind of things. And uh, you, uh, in case of Jared Diamond, three things, uh, g guns, germs, and steel. And uh, somehow they these three things give people an advantage. What I don't even know what Jared Diamond would say if I asked him. Um, you know, guns and steel have been in uh, sub-Saharan Africa for now a couple of hundred years. And they have been used for slaughtering each other. So, uh, what? Uh, why did Sub-Saharan Africa not emerge from its wretchedness, despite that they have now had guns, germs, and steels for the last three hundred years? Right, and you're you're referencing the the book, the Killer Apps of Western Civilization by. Niall Ferguson, and both of these gentlemen are essentially using reason, using rational minds to try to uh, undercut uh, reason, which is which is a little bit a little bit odd. But it does get me to my my next question, which is that you see as the main distinction between the West and the rest the concept of reason. And when when I think of reason, I think of first of all the pre-Socratics, the philosophers before Socrates, such as Thales, who looked at the world and and decided to come up with natural explanations of what was going on. In his case, the world is made out of water and he had various arguments uh, for that. So it's not the gods that are doing this and that, but there's a kind of a mechanical explanation. And this would evolve to the four elements uh, later on. And then eventually this would get to the scientific method and the scientific mindset, which looks to explain the world in terms that are not appealing to kind of external unseen things. On top of that, I would say that reason involves logic. So that is a, a way of evaluating claims based on their truthfulness, likelihood, or connection from one step in an idea to the next. I would appreciate if you would kind of get as deep into this as you would like. You know, what is reason? And and maybe a easier question is, how does a rational person act? What what kind of outward manifestations of their inner reason would we see? So, uh, Gabriel, I grew up in a society where uh, which was dominated by by magical thinking, which was dominated by authoritarianism. If I asked my teacher a question, the response usually was a slap. The, the authorities never explained to you why you had to do a certain thing. We had to do certain things because we were told to do, do those certain things. Uh, we were supposed to believe in uh, what I would call stupid rituals, uh, a stupid way of behavior. Uh, and uh, we were told do's and do don'ts about life. There was no logical structure that was ever presented to us on why we had to do things in a certain way. Uh, questioning anything was virtually forbidden. Uh, it was sacrilegious, not just in religious terms, but in cultural terms to be questioning anything. Now, when I went to the UK, I realized that uh, people were questioning their professors, people were questioning each other's. And more importantly, um, when you have a, a, a discussion in, in, a, in a third world country, which are not based on reason, based on emotions, uh, 
any differences invariably lead to a confrontation, which can be a verbal confrontation, a decay in friendship, um, or even a physical confrontation. People start shouting at each other. What I realized in the United Kingdom was that uh, I could have very different opinions from my uh, Western uh, colleagues, uh, but that did not necessarily bring in a fragmentation in, in relationships. We could uh, continue uh, uh, communicating and uh, more likely than not, they actually liked me more for confronting them because subliminally they realized that I was contributing to enlightening them, contributing to make them think. And so was my behavior, actually. I was very pleased to be conf- confronted in a rational way. Um, and uh, and someone who would make me think, analyze, and go deeply into the situations. So this is, uh, you know, at a gross level, this is what the difference between a rational and an irrational society is. Irrational societies are driven by emotions and solely by emotions. Uh, and even if they these people are high IQ and get educated, they have a tendency to use their intelligence and reason to justify their emotions. Uh, whereas what I experienced in the West, and of course this is not always true, but it's it, it com- relative to what I had seen, what I saw was that reason had constrained emotions in the Western society. People knew that they had to control their appetites. They had to control their thinking. They had to challenge their thinking. So reason was a tool. Reason wasn't everything, but it was a tool that constrained and carved out their emotions and uh, brought out the best out of their emotions. I do think if if one thinks of the Socratic, the the Platonic uh, dialogues of of Socrates, you know, it, it it's him going around asking people questions, and to do that, the, you know, there's some amount of humility involved, you know, becoming vulnerable to become stronger afterward, which involves kind of restraining and avoiding emotions, um, an interest in interest in ideas, an interest in the truth, and kind of breaking down things into logical components and, and definitions. And things of this sort. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Gabriel, I have said this many times, and again, uh, because I uh, because this is some, so unique that people in the Western world find it difficult to digest. Let me say this again: that when at the age of twenty five I arrived in the United Kingdom, I realized something funny in my interactions with European people. They were speaking truth for the sake of speaking the truth. Um, now. I had no such concept. I spoke, and the society that I grew up in, India, spoke what was expedient and convenient for them. So you were, you lied, you cheated, you manipulated uh, using your language. Uh, And this was uh, ever present in the society. Uh, And this is not just about Hindus. This this is also about uh, Muslims and other religions. The concept of truth is actually not in their minds and hearts. They don't really understand it uh, and they lie all the time and they say what is expedient. Uh, And this is something which I found so shocking when I arrived in the United Kingdom because um, I was told by people when I was, you know, I was working for an organization and I was trying to lie uh, to help that organization materially. And I was told, hey, we don't do these things. Uh, We just want to say what the truth is. Now, of course, we have, you know, propaganda and marketing has increased in the West. Liars have come into existence. As we have lost, as we in the West have lost connection with Western philosophy, as we have lost connection with uh, Christianity and uh, uh, our uh, the Western roots. Uh, but uh, this is my memory from early nineties that uh, people spoke the truth. People were uh, uh, people had this in- instinct for truthfulness, and it continues in many ways uh, e- even today in the Western world. Now, giant. The other part of Western culture that you tend to highlight is the concept of honor. And I wanted to also think about this concept. Um, You say that honor is something that is missing from a lot of the third world. And uh, not a lot of people think about the concept of honor, but I found a definition I think is somewhat good. Uh, 
honesty, fairness, or integrity in one's beliefs and actions, uh, that might do some work. You talk about, for example, uh, here's a scenario. So you show a lot of videos on your Twitter profile, which is which is excellent for people who want to uh, find out some some sampling of what you're talking about. And you show a lot of police that hit Indians and the Indian people do not fight back. And so I, I'm wondering maybe in an example like that, you know, what can we learn about honor and how does it manifest in a person? A lot of these things, uh, Gabriel, uh, truthfulness, honesty, integrity, honor, philosophically are connected at some level. Uh, you, you can't have one of these things and not have other of these things. The concept of honor is conspicuous by its absence in the third world countries. I remember, Gabriel, my first flight to Africa, and I think I was, uh, I was either going to Zimbabwe or Johannesburg. I watched uh, the, a couple of uh, movies uh, to do with uh, sub-Saharan Africa, the Idi Amin's movie, and uh, also about Sierra Leone. Uh, and I was uh, very scared about arriving in Africa. I thought I, there would be people uh, fighting all over. There would be gangs running around with AK-47s. Uh, but um, I arrived in, uh, in, in Af sub-Saharan Africa and realized that there was actually a lot of sheepishness among people, which is very contrary to the conventional wisdom and the Western media projects uh, sub-Saharan Africa or even, you know, people from Afghanistan or Pakistan as people who are warriors who are um, there to fight. Um, but the reality, the ground reality is very different. The ground reality is that these people are very sheepish. You rape them. Uh, if the policeman stops them, they take their pants off and they bend over. Uh, and this is true with men and women. Uh, there is no concept of honor. Um, they, they, they are very sheepish. They never, ever fight back. Um, they now do want to uh, trouble other people. They do want to fight with other people, but only if they know for sure that the other person is weak, in which the winning is guaranteed. So there's a lot of sheepishness and lack of honor in these societies, but uh, it really gets very bad in uh, South Asia, South South Asia, uh, the Indian subcontinent, uh, where the concept of honor is conspicuous by its absence. Um, there is uh, people lie and cheat uh, and manipulate others basically nonstop. And uh, they vote based on uh, their material expectations, uh, their tribal expectations. And even among tribes that there is no honor, because while these are tribal countries, uh, people within the tribes are trying to gain supremacy of their tribe. So people are very atomized uh, and isolated, uh, despite that they claim to be a part of big groups. Uh, so, you know, Muslims would say that, hey, Islam is a nation. Uh, but the tr reality is that uh, people of Indian subcontinent, particularly uh, these people who, who lack uh, honor more than people of the Middle East, uh, uh, are the kind of people who who are very atomized, who don't uh, uh, don't don't have any uh, emotional or um, philosophical association with anyone else. Now, the the West itself is is not doing as well as it could be these days, and you see signs of degradation wherever you look. Uh, taking Americans for an example, um, they don't look after their bodies. They dress very poorly. They have nihilistic tendencies, which manifest in tattoos and colored hair, rampant drug use. When I'm in there, in that country, I see vaping shops on every street corner. Uh, people are wearing sexual preferences on their sleeves like savages. Uh, women in their 20s talk endlessly about astrology, and they believe it, and they believe in manifestation. And I'm just wondering, Giant, if you were to do the critical documentary thing, not to the third world, but to the West, to point out some of the things that you see, especially because the West, the West does need a wake-up call, what are the symptoms that you see of degrading Western societies and maybe certain behaviors that Western people don't realize that they are now doing? Gabriel, it's easy for me to criticize the Western society, but remember, Western society is still a thousand, a hundred thousand, or a million times better than the third world countries. So I would uh, live in the West uh, any time over a, a, a wretched 
uh, irrational, feral place like uh, like India. Uh, and despite its degradation, I can't see how the West can ever get degraded to the level that India is even in a thousand years. So from that perspective, which is very important because most things in life are not in black and white, but in shades of grays, um, you have to understand that the West is still an ex- a superior civilization. It's, the, it's probably still the only civilization, although East Asia has copied a lot of good things from, from the Western society. Um, my view, Gabriel, is that one of the worst things that we ever did was to adopt democracy in the Western world. Uh, and adoption of democracy meant that the bottom 50% plus 1% gained an upper hand over the top uh, people uh, which meant that we inverted meritocracy in the in the first world countries um, what we now have in the first world country increasingly with every uh, cycle of election is worsening uh, of politics um, and we have very simple minded mass minded bread and circuses people coming into power in the western society uh, now uh, at the end of the day, because governments are the most, by far the most powerful institutions uh, in the world, everyone has to eventually directly or indirectly follow the dictates of these uh, simplistic, naive, mass-minded bread and circuses uh, uh, politicians. Um, uh, and these people have, uh, you know, they want to cater to the mass, uh, the masses, the the lowest common denominator, because they are the people who give the most votes. Uh, so, so if I had to uh, conclude why the West decided to degrade itself, it was be- it, because of democracy, and because they instituted certain policies, companies had to institute similar policies. For example, uh, governments are encouraging all companies to have female and people of color in the board of directors. And now companies are basically forced into following that path. So um, I, I think that is where the degradation is started. And these people don't really know the limits. They don't really know the limits of bread and circuses. So uh, you know, every election cycle is about who can offer more free stuff and who can offer more hedonistic, which actually now in the minds of the masses look very cool and very attractive. So so that's the direction uh, Western society has gone I- into. Uh, but really, uh, West wasn't like that until not too far in the past. Uh, the, People, uh, only a limited number of people had the right to vote. The West originally was a controlled democracy, if at all it was a democracy. Um, East Asia copied that concept and has kept itself a controlled democracy. Now, I'm not saying I uh, that's a perfect solution, but um, but controlling democracy is extremely important. You have to ensure that your institutions are based on merit and not based on uh, mob psychology. Uh, and unfortunately, by giving into those things, we have these uh, you know, naked adults now dancing in front of uh, children. And we w- don't want to call it pedophilia anymore. We want to you know, what we call it probably sex, sex, sex education for children or gender education for children, making them more about their gender. Try these things in historical Europe or try these things in today's East Asia and these people would get hang drawn and quartered. I'll point out to my American listeners that the original founding documents of America mentioned nothing about democracy whatsoever. In fact, the founding fathers were very skeptical of it and that the as American history goes on, you get more people who have the right to vote, including in the 19th Amendment, uh, women get the right to vote, uh, 1910s. And a lot of people would see that point in American history as the start of a decline. Um, we know that women tend to vote uh, differently than men, um, particularly left-leaning. So interesting to think about. Now, Giant, you are a libertarian, but this this confuses some people. And so I wanted to ask you this question because a lot of people see libertarianism as an economic term mostly, which means uh, limiting government in, in all possible ways. But uh, if I'm correct, your views are that we shouldn't be looking at economic systems, but cultures, and that some people deserve freedom and others actually deserve restraint. Uh, I'm wondering if you would agree with that. 
Well, um, I wouldn't put it that way. I, I think everyone deserves freedom to live his life the way he wants to live. Um, every culture, every society should be allowed to live their own ways, uh, even if they conflict with my ways of uh, living. So if people in Afghanistan want to um, wear the burqa, the black garb, uh, I'm perfectly fine with them as long as uh, they want to do it that way. I don't want to impose my ideas on other people. What does matter to me is when their ideas start influencing me. So would I want to invite some such people to come and live with me in France? Uh, my thinking would have been a complete no-no to such people, and I would have stopped arrival of such people into France from day one. Um, now, uh, of course, uh, Europe has... Uh, basically opened its uh, gates and uh, people of uh, different cultures, different views and different beliefs have entered Europe and they have become a permanent part of Europe today. So, uh, you know, at, 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 uh, philosophically, I want people to have all the freedoms they want, but I don't want to create a situation in which they start dictating their views on me. Uh, but also there are things which uh, in which we should we have to have social opprobrium so while i might uh, let them live and let live but i still have an opinion on them i i think there should be social opprobrium associated with being single mothers uh, intentionally single mothers uh, being a drug addict uh, or uh, de- being dependent on on the society in terms of welfare payments something that uh, that has become very shameless shameless uh, increasingly in the western society people uh, people have no social opprobrium associated with uh, having being single mothers or using drugs or or expecting money from other people through the government. So uh, I, I think uh, there, there has to be social opprobrium if you want to have a civilization and, and society. And that is why I increasingly think that Christianity did that job. Now, I am an atheist, Gabriel. I don't believe in any religion, but I think Christianity provided that infrastructure, that fabric of social opprobrium, which meant that you did not necessarily require a heavy-handed government to impose a moral code on the society. So yes, philosophically, I'm a libertarian, but uh, in practice, uh, I uh, I have to say I'm a conservative. And I think uh, when, when the rubber meets the road, uh, every libertarian, once he matures, is likely to become increasingly conservative. I thought we could take a diversion here to global issues, geopolitics, and get your thoughts on uh, a few of these. Now, there is a narrative out there that we have the BRIC, the BRICS nations. So Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. I'm not sure why South Africa is there, but the idea is that these countries are not typically friends of the United States and they have various agreements between each other. And they have they have moved in the last few years to get away from transacting in the dollar and transacting in, well, some other kind of currency, but using this association as a way of divesting themselves of the US dollar and US involvement in their going songs. And these are 42% of the world population. Um, I'm curious, what, what is your an- analysis of the narrative that we are going to de-dollarize because the BRICS nations are going to make it happen? And should the West be worried? Well, firstly, most of that 42%, most of the population of BRICS comes from China and India. Um, China and India have, I don't think there's any border open between China and India. They have thousands of kilometers of common border, but there's no road connection between the two countries. They don't trust each other. They don't really talk with each other. Uh, The Indian media is full of anti-Chinese propaganda. Uh, and very f- erroneous information about China. Virtually everything India does is anti-Chinese and everything, most of those things are erroneous. They don't really understand China despite being a neighbor of China. Uh, 
they can't really trust each other, uh, which means that uh, invariably they have to uh, use the U.S. dollar to transact with each other. So that takes care of most of the 42% that you referred to about BRICS. But let's talk about uh, Russia and India. Russia and India have been friends for forever. You know, even during the Cold War period, uh, India claimed itself to be a non-aligned country, but it always followed the footsteps of Russia. That said, um, you know, for, for a year or two, India has been trying to buy $2 billion worth of uh, Russian uh, spare parts for India's armed forces. Um, unfortunately, they can't transact with uh, each other's currencies because they don't trust each other. They have to use the U.S. dollar. Uh, and uh, Russia cannot use the U.S. dollar these days. So they are stuck there. Uh, so the fact remains, uh, Gabriel, that uh, despite that uh, they, they claim that they want to detach themselves from the Western society. They actually depend on the Western society, primarily America. Now, America is no saint, and I dislike the Washington bureaucrats, and I don't dislike what how Washington bureaucrats think and how they disturb and create problems uh, outside uh, the United States and even in, including inside the United States. But even among all these people, the U.S. is by far the best country on the planet, and that is exactly why the U.S. dollar has historically been a reserve currency, and I don't see how it will get washed away as as a reserve currency for the foreseeable future. Uh, but here is a problem. Uh, as time goes by now, people Countries are keeping less and less of the U.S. dollar, which means that the capacity of U.S. printing press is now, uh, they, they can't really print at uh, wish. They can't really print their paper and send them uh, send them offshore because now uh, people outside the U.S. are keeping less and uh, com- particularly countries are keeping less and less of U.S. dollar in reserves. But, uh, you know, look at India. Uh, currently, if you want to, buy US dollar on the street in India, you cannot find it, even if you pay about 10 to 20% premium over the official rate. So that's how respected US dollar is, because given the kind of dishonesty and lack of integrity that that exists in, in India and the third world countries and um, you know most of these BRICS countries, uh, I would make an exception of China, actually, uh, that they have, they, they, in their mind, the U.S. dollar is still a very good currency to hold. On a related topic, I wanted to ask your thoughts about the trade war that, I guess, Trump had with China. Trump uh, claimed that China was devaluing their currency and that they should be punished for doing so, whereas libertarians like Peter Schiff might say that China well, is holding the debt of Americans. It's giving Americans a very cheap lifestyle and that the U.S. should not have a trade war at all. Was was Trump's trade war with China justified and is it actually good for the U.S.? Um, well, it's hard to say, uh, Gabriel. Uh, you know, I wouldn't want to have a trade war based on uh, someone devaluing its uh, his currency, because as Peter Schiff said, uh, if I can get something cheaper, why not? Why not? Would I take that? Uh, but at the same time, uh, we, uh, you know, there's there's more to do there than just about. Uh, about economics. Uh, it is inc- Some people believe, and I'm no insider to this, but some people believe that China influences elections in the Western society. And if that is true, uh, China needs to be steered in the right direction. I, Gabriel, I continue to believe, and I, uh, I think China is the only uh, Second world country in uh, in the world. It is the only. Th- it was the only third world world country that had the possibility to become a first world country. And China is is a country that the West should try to steer into its um, scope of influence because China. Ha- is one of those rare countries that has a possibility to become fully westernized. So while I love China and I think China is doing great things and I uh, I, I like the changes that are happening in China, uh, uh, 
we we have to accept i have to accept that uh, a lot of leadership in china are very likely a product of uh, a thinking in which they wanted to control and manipulate other countries and if that is what was happening and this is what uh, the intelligence of the united states was telling uh, the us and if that is why trump wanted to impose certain restrictions on china i could very well understand those uh, I do want to move to some questions on India now. In our past, our previous episode seventy seven, and in other, on uh, in other forums, you have said that Hinduism did not exist until a hundred years ago. So, uh, Gabriel, uh, as I said uh, in your last uh, dis- in our last discussion, the co- the concept of caste is a structured concept. The concept of Hinduism is a structured concept. Uh, imposed by rational people on what was completely feral what was completely wild actually uh, so europe british missionaries and british colonizers uh, because of their habit of giving a structure to everything thought there must be an underlying structure to the chaos that they found in india uh, now they should have actually accepted uh, india as a chaos and left it at that because by imposing um um a fake construct a fake structure on it they gave a structure to what was actually wild um hinduism wasn't a concept until uh, the british uh, until about 100 years back the caste system was in written terms uh, is structured by the british uh, but uh, every indian is an atomized person there are literally thousands and thousands of religions and castes in that country um, and um, there was a certain kind of movement happening uh, in india in uh, mid to late 19th century in which they wanted to uh, bring together all this disparate uh, pagan religions into one uniform Uh, entity uh, and uh, and that process has continued today uh, and this was branded as hinduism and a lot of that was against uh, uh, in opposition to islam uh, islam was a structured um, co- uh, or a structured uh, religion uh, and uh, there was nothing against it everyone was a minority in front of them so uh, they they wanted to bring these together also i think uh, european colonizers realized that uh, these was just such uh, uh, atomized people that they needed to uh, to be g- provided a forum to uh, feel connected with each other if they wanted to live uh, with each other uh, because these people just uh, didn't get along with uh, anyone not even with their own family members so they wanted to probably uh, provide a structure to these people but unfortunately what uh, everyone fails to understand except that european colonizers did understand it at a certain level is that you have to change the minds of individual people before you change the culture and before you uh, impose institutions on them uh, the mind never got changed the culture never got changed uh, and you you imposed this concept of hinduism among them uh, but they are under underpinning that is all feral people very atomized people who have no unity who hate each other everyone hates each other uh, they um, so 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 that is where the hinduism is uh, and in my point of in my view uh, gabriel hinduism is going to be a worse um, a religion for the world than islam and islam has as you can see horrendous consequences for europe currently uh, and uh, hinduism will turn out to be uh, very likely worse because they are they are very f- wild they have no concept of honor and no concept of integrity every interaction in a temple in in india is a bribe to the god there is no there's virtually no spiritual there's actually no spirituality in hindu temples it's all about bribing the god for a better future or the better afterlife um so so there's no nothing underpinning this religion as such since we're going back in time let's f- go forward 25 years to 1947 this is when india and pakistan got their their independence their their freedom 
that glorious year, right? The the year that Salman Rushdie's magisterial novel, Midnight's Children, starts off with, and his character was born at the exact moment that India gained independence. Now, I understand you don't think independence has been good for India, but in an immediate practical sense, uh, this must have been a glorious moment for the Indian subcontinent. What was it like back then from what you know? Firstly, I, I want to challenge you on the use of this word independence because it's uh, this word independence is used too flippantly. Uh, India never got independence. Uh, Indian rule passed from the hands of rational Europeans to a bunch of junkies, brain-dead people uh, uh, in 1947. Um, so I don't call it independence. If I must be ruled, I prefer to be ruled by more rational and more moral people who have a fence, uh, sense of fairness and justice. What came after the British were uh, colored people. Um, now, just because their skin color is similar to mine does not make them my people because they are junkies, they are brain dead, they are venal, they are thoroughly corrupt. Uh, now, uh, talking about this glorious uh, uh, passing of rule from Europeans to brown people, uh, the fact is, uh, Gabriel, that this is a known thing that a lot of people from villages, rural areas, even urban areas used to ask until about 30 to 40 years back, what happened to those white people? Why don't we see them anymore? Uh, most Indians had no clue about this passing of rule from European colonizers to brown people. Uh, they, 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 they had no concept of independence. They don't. They had no concept of uh, uh, na the the nation state. Uh, when I was growing up, the Hin Hindi word for nation called desh did not mean nation as we have come to to understand today. Desh those days meant your local area. That's all these people meant. They had no concept of what was outside their village or their tribal. Uh, uh, element. So this whole gloriousness did not exist. It was uh, mostly uh, a concept followed by people who had been educated in the Europe and who wanted to gain power in India. Um, uh, I would say 80 to 90 percent people had no interest or participation in this uh, past uh, so-called independence, except that they suffered hugely from this creation of two nation states at, uh, in 1947. Was it chaotic the year, the week, the day that supposed independence was granted? Well, in 1947, uh, I think anything between one to four million people got uh, killed and raped uh, because, again, this is, uh, this is a society, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, these are the societies uh, with no concept of honor, uh, respect, uh, and, and a sense of justice. So people who were trying to move to the other side because they thought they had to move to the other side because of the religion they believed in, uh, got raped if they got caught uh, in, in mobs of the other community. Uh, and, you know, this, this is something very interesting. I don't know how common the term gang rape is in, in the Western society, but um, my belief is that it is... Uh, virtually non-existent. Uh, in India, there's a concept called, called gang rape in which a bunch of men get together to rape a woman uh, uh, because they think they can confide in other men, they can, uh, they can get into this uh, rape, uh, spineless behavior of forcing a woman. Um, and this is what happened at a large scale in 1947 when the when, when the demarcation of India and Pakistan happened. Now, India was never a country before the British. This, these were, even during the British times, these were about 400 kingdoms and principalities. Uh, British, for whatever reason, thought leaving it as a two-country structure would be a better thing. And I think that was the right thing to do because, uh, because the problem is that... Uh, you can't have an, a discussion with an Indian. Uh, and that is true even today. You know, you can sit down with an educated Indian and you can't really have a rational discussion because there's no accepted form of reasoning between the two people. They discuss in emotions. So imagine 400 countries uh, in what is today Indian subcontinent. They would be fighting with each other. There would be no 
possibility of sitting down, sitting down together and discussing the border between the two countries. Uh, and that is very likely the problem between India and China today. India just refuses to sit down and discuss and demarcate uh, a border between China and India. Um, so uh, British thought it would be a good thing to leave these two as uh, these people as two separate entities. Uh, but then, uh, as you can see, India and Pakistan cannot agree on anything and they, they are forever at uh, uh, fighting with each other, blowing each other away uh, very spinelessly, actually. They can't have a war because they are too incompetent and too unwarrior-like, but they still want to uh, uh, blow away each other and backstab each other. This is going to seem like a random question, but in the West from Hippocrates, the Greek, the ancient Greek physician, you have the Hippocratic Oath, which is kind of a set of moral guidelines for how a doctor should behave when, when treating someone. And one of these is that you should treat somebody regardless of if they can pay or not. Um, and that will get sorted out later. Is that the case in India? Oh, never, never, uh, Gabriel. If I am in India and I have a problem, I want to leave the country and get myself to a better place to get uh, treated. I uh, there was uh, you know I can give you cases after cases in which uh, people go to the hospital and die. Every Indian you can talk with will tell you a horror story about Indian hospitals where people actually go to die because uh, either doctors are not trained properly uh, or because they uh, they you know they remove your organs or uh, want to be, do things which you should which should not be done uh, and that results in in your death my granddad died that way because uh, the 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 hospital wanted to keep him in the hospital and charge us uh, a crazy sum of money um, the doctors are very untrained uh, they um, the the in 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 i think most in most parts of india now a quok who goes through the historical indian medicine system uh, can call himself a doctor he actually uses the word doctor in front of his name and then uh, runs the uh, icus at uh, western hospital so the whole hospitalization system is extraordinarily corrupt uh, and uh, the evidence of that is in the fact that about uh, 10 to 15 years back, India emerged as the Medicare uh, part of the world, where people thought they could go to to get uh, inexpensive medical care done, to get their surgeries done and return back to the US. Uh, but very rapidly, all that migrated from India to Thailand and Philippines because uh, uh, the, the, the Indian hospitals were so dishonest about absolutely everything. Uh, you can, uh, you know, I uh, I have been to government hospitals and uh, the doctors openly ask for bribes. If you don't pay me a certain amount of money, uh, it will lead to amputation of uh, this person's leg or kind of thing. So uh, extremely dishonest and this dishonesty is openly conducted. Changing topic a little, a little bit here, but still remaining with India. Uh, the stereotype, which is true, is that Indians like gold. They have a lot of gold. Um, Indians have a ton of gold. And your argument has been that they like gold because they have a negative yielding economy. And I think people might not be aware of that or really be able to grasp what that means. What, what exactly does that mean? A negative yielding economy? Uh, firstly, the reason why Indians like to buy gold is because they can't trust each other. They can't trust their government. They can't trust their fiat currency uh, because there's very high inflation. Uh, but then they fear confiscation of their bank accounts. They, f uh, they, they can't trust their own family members. So what they do is that they buy gold and secretly hide gold from the rest of their families. So this runs rampant in, in Indian society. So if one person dies with gold hidden uh, somewhere, uh, the gold basically gets lost uh, because he will likely have not told his own wife and children about the gold because he can't trust his own wife and children. So that's one of the 
big reasons why Indians buy gold because they can't trust anyone at all. Um, they don't trust investing uh, in the country because they know that these rapacious tax authorities will come down and uh, steal away their investments. If they give money to other companies, that com- those companies will steal their, their money. Uh, and uh, uh, that is what the Indian stock market is full of. Uh, their 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 balance sheets their financial accounts mean nothing because these people are there to steal your money um, so uh, that is the biggest reason why indians uh, invested in gold and will continue to invest in gold uh, now let's talk about the negative yielding economy i was surprised when uh, in 2008 or something when uh, the yield on U.S. Uh, treasuries became negative, and people started talking about how unnatural neg- negative yields were. Uh, and I, my immediate thought was that no, this the negative yielding economies have existed forever. These, this is the concept of the third world countries, because the capital actually gets frittered away with time rather than accumulate, because the capital. Uh, is not productive. It is. Uh, it gets stolen away. It gets frittered away, uh, and uh, you, as a result, have a negative yielding economies in these countries. I also appreciate your your discussions of, of economics. You go into these conferences and and you kind of blow people's minds with your statistics and and uh, insights um, and exposing a lot of the political correctness of a lot of these global institutions. I did want to ask you this, uh, Giant, which is that people here, if they know anything about India and the caste system, they hear this term untouchables. I'm just curious, what is an untouchable and what is the life like of an untouchable? Um, again, uh, untouchable was a, a, a word created by, I think, Gandhi. Um, it did not exist earlier. Uh, everyone is an untouchable in India. You you know, you everyone, as I explained to you last time, everyone is trying to, in every interaction, uh, dis- working out who is superior and who is inferior. Every interaction with an Indian is in which uh, uh, an Indian is either going to be submissive or trying to be tyrannical. Uh, and that is why when you talk with Indians, uh, the, he either uses sir or madam three times in a sentence or expects to be called sir or madam three times in a set sentence. So every interaction with uh, an, an Indian is like that. Uh, now, untouchable, uh, you know, the, 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 some of the people came to be known as untouchable because these were the people who were cleaning uh, uh, feces. Uh, you know, remember, half of Indians is still uh, poop in the open. Uh, and they were looking, you know, they were cleaning with their hands uh, the, 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 the feces of human beings, um, and they were treated as untouchables. But, um, but you know, this, the, the funny thing is, uh, Gabriel, what people fail to realize is that you can't elevate these untouchables to uh, a different place because they themselves practice untouchability. And when you elevate them into a higher place, they become worse tyrants than the tyrants that they replace because then they want to practice untouchability on other untouchables. And that is why exactly why I say that India does not have four or five castes that uh, British thought India had. Uh, it actually has, a f- you know, something like 3,000 to 30,000 castes. But as I say, it has 1.4 billion castes. Everyone is trying to prove who is superior and who is inferior. And uh, uh, and untouchables are not outside that way of thinking. They are actually more prone to that way of thinking. Most of the caste-related fights that you hear about in the media are usually fights between two untouchable groups or two lower caste groups trying to decide who is superior among them. So this is a, a far more complicated situation than uh, the media in its uh, tries to project in very simplistic and naive terms. Last time you suggested that we should comment on something you said last time, which is that 90% of rape cases in India are false. Now, I'm sure there's a lot to unpack in this, in, in what's going on here. So um, where to begin? 
Okay, so firstly, uh, Gabriel, uh, for people who want to decide that I'm a misogynist, India is very likely a rape capital of the world. So uh, I I completely agree with that. Uh, Indians will use every opportunity to exploit other people. Uh, That is true with men. And unfortunately, that is true with women. And it is probably more true with women than it is true with men. And that leads to me to the statement that I made. Uh, I probably erroneously said 90% of cases are fake. They are probably 95 to 99% of rape cases are fake. Um, If you have an argument with women, uh, it is not unlikely that, uh, and I have been told this thing by many women, they do these things and they, they challenge you with this, they tell you that they would file a rape case or molestation case against you because you have an argument on something uh, which is non-criminal. So you may have an argument about money or you said something, hey, uh, you are not doing this properly. And it is not unlikely that a girl or a woman uh, would respond by saying that, hey, I'll charge you with molestation case if you don't... uh, Uh, follow what I ask you to do. Uh, So what actually ends up happening is that uh, uh, most of the rape and dowry cases filed with the police are fake. These uh, girls and women want to exploit uh, men um, and they they openly then blackmail these men after they have filed uh, fake uh, rape cases. Now, because uh, pol- the, because of very you know Indians, because Indians don't have a, c- a concept of fairness, the police will arrest. If you're charged with rape, police will arrest you bef- and put you in jail, where you will be sodomized, you will be beaten up, and you will be kept for months or years before court will have its first hearing. So you are likely to spend years in the prison on false rape case. Um, when uh, uh, before you even get your first hearing. Now, you can read news in the Indian media in which, uh, you know, the headline would be that uh, a, a, a female live-in partner files a rape case against uh, the man. So she lived with a man for eight years, uh, had a child with the, with, with the man, and then says that he raped her. And the police will accept that rape case. So that is the first thing. Most cases uh, of rape are fake rape cases. And the police is required to file all claims of rape, whether there's any evidence at all or not, uh, as rape cases when it, a woman goes to the police station. Now, this is another problem, uh, Gabriel, that a woman who actually gets raped, when she goes to the police station, when she tells the policeman that, hey, I got raped, the policeman is unlikely to hear that she got raped. Uh, So the police does not even have to register that case because he did not hear the word rape. She might say that a million times, but the policeman doesn't hear it. So it does not become a rape case. So a real raped woman has no courage to go to the Indian predatory, corrupt policeman, because this policeman is more likely than not to get bribes from the rapist. Uh, So uh, most cases, rape cases are false, filed cases are false, but most real rape cases never go to the police. Now, is this a, in the West, there there is a serious problem with this kind of thing as well, where there are a lot of allegations of rape and most of the time, it's women who regret uh, being involved with a particular man and just want to hold it against him. Is this something that is new in India in recent years? Well, firstly, um, the, 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 this is uh, new only to the extent that laws have become favorable to women at the cost of men. Uh, they have become, you know, and the the politicians want to look very charitable and politicians think that they are immune from the problems created by the, these laws. So uh, to that extent, yes, uh, this is new uh, because uh, police probably mostly disregarded rape cases uh, uh, at an earlier time. Uh, uh, 
so yes, uh, to that extent, uh, this is something new in the country. But uh, remember that uh, this is not just about women who regret later. Uh, you know, that is that is not something that is usually the case in India. Uh, in usually in India, it's just about simple and plain fake rape cases. And, you know, women can say in a crowd, come to a police station that this guy raped me in a crowded bus. Now, there were 50 other people watching. There was no rape, but uh, she can claim it and the police will register because she would pay a bribe and uh, the police will then uh, get this guy arrested and the police would then expect a bribe from the guy. So this is this is only a cycle of corruption in that country. Well, it's 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 a million times worse in India, Gabriel. I would, uh, if I am sitting next to a girl uh, in on a plane in India, I would I would want to switch my seat. Uh, I would certainly, if I'm waiting for a plane to uh, before the gate, I will not sit next to a woman in India because I know that there is zero fairness and justice in that system. Uh, and I would happily do it outside the country. I would happily do it in the West because I know that there's a, there's a huge amount, relative to what exists in India, there's a huge amount of fairness and I would be treated properly. I have a few questions here designed to be answered uh, rapid fire. Uh, single word or uh, brief explanation. Are you up for that? Sure. Name a book that changed the way that you see the world. Uh, the Bell Curve by Charles Murray. The, well, and just to expand on this, the book is mostly about the U.S., uh, but it helped me un, under, think about the IQs of people to help me understand and connect the dots of my traveling experience around the world. That book gave me a way of thinking to give a structure to my experiences from my traveling. There are assumptions about uh, Indians being fairly high tech, and I wonder if you had some statistics uh like how many indians have have phones how many have internet access uh, how many have used an atm machine uh, well uh, a lot of indians have phones uh, uh, indians apparently use more data than uh, china and us combined uh, and uh, data on cell phones and uh, one has to really understand why that is the case uh, the hard the hard cabling uh, Telephony never really came into existence in the country. Uh, when I was in India living in 90s, I had to pay a bribe of about $200, $200 of those days, which was an absolute fortune for India to get a telephone connection. And every time my telephone went dead, I had to give a huge amount of bribe to get it repaired. Uh, I had to give a bribe to use my telephone line for fax purposes. Uh, so that was the kind of background that we come from. So people did not have hardwired telephony. So most people now have simple cell phones. Uh, and uh, clearly they as a result, use data of their cell phones. And um, a lot of that data is used for pornography. If you look at how data is used, I have seen some statistics. Uh, Pakistan and India rank among the very top in terms of uh, going on uh, porn uh, websites and downloading porn uh, uh, movies. Uh, so, so. Uh, People who want to think that uh, this data connection has led to an enlightenment in the country are completely wrong. Uh, this has led to a massive increase in uh, depravities in the country and massive increase in superstition. Very ironically, very massive increase in superstitions because people forward each other on WhatsApp uh, all the superstitious messages and uh, anti uh, and messages against other religions. Muslims do it about Hindus, and Hindus do it about Muslims. Um, um, so, so, uh, so that is the the status with internet. Now, talking about the technical competencies of India, uh, this is crazy, uh, uh, Gabriel. You know, you hardly see a technically competent person in that country. If I call, forget about an electrician or a computer guy, if I call a plumber to uh, set my tap in order, he will almost certainly create three more problems uh, when he leaves. So 
despite the fact that in Canada, I would get a plumber to do my repairs because it's just more efficient for me. In India, I would do it myself because any uh, bringing in a plumber to address a problem will lead to three new problems. So I better do it myself. So Indians are technically totally incompetent. Now, um, the, 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 the software industry in in the West, in which there are a lot of Indians, are mostly back office, uh, clerical kind of um, uh, software people. Uh, and uh, they uh, were there at the right time, at the right place. India was uh, among those rare countries that spoke uh, that new more English than most other countries in 1990s. And these per, these people, at least as long as they had warm bodies, could do the work that was desperately required for the West. So Indian IT industry compared to the rest of the economy grew very rapidly. But, uh, you know, thinking that Indians now dominate the IT industry is completely it's a complete lie. Chinese IT industry is four, five, six times bigger than Indian IT industry is. Chinese cater to their internal demands. Indians cater to virtually none of their internal demands. They only work as back office, clerical work for Western countries. And Western managements are uh, increasingly Indian uh, because of what happened in 90s. Uh, and they prefer to uh, bring in more Indians uh, because they know how to exploit Indians better. Uh, now, they are not, of course, not doing it out of charity for Indians. They just know how to exploit Indians better. And you talk with IT people, your uh, friends in uh, in the US who work in, in information technology, and they will tell you that a lot of software created by Indians is scrappy. Uh, and it has to be redone after every few years. Uh, but then short terminism in terms of profitability makes a lot of management ignore that aspect. Uh, but moreover, political correctness means that uh, it is very difficult for us, for someone to say that uh, we are getting bad software from India. Uh, I would uh, actually, uh, I increasingly ask why we have uh, bridges collapsing in, in, in the US. Why do we have so much of forest fires? Uh, why do we have uh, electricity outages in parts of North America? And my question always is, is it because the management that is running is incompetent? And I increasingly conclude that uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, people having elevated into higher positions of power without being competent. And uh, that is clearly what I have seen in, in living in Silicon Valley. I live in San Francisco and I, I come across uh, a lot of IT people. There's also a massive amount of corruption in uh, in H-1B, one b visa issues, fake CVs, fake resumes, uh, and you uh, Western companies even end up um, uh, interviewing fake people in India when they actually get people to the US, they are different from who they interviewed. That was very interesting. And I realize now that that was not a, uh, a rapid fire question that I should have asked you. May maybe some that, that can be answered more quickly so that, so that we can uh, get you out of here. Do Hong Kong and Taiwan make your cut for the West? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I think Hong Kong and Taiwan are uh, very good countries. They are, they have preserved some of the best values of the Western society, although they have not underpinned their societies with Western philosophy yet, but they have some great institutions copied from the West. Which of these, if any, would make your cut for second world nations? Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand? Uh, Malaysia and Vietnam. Uh, Thailand could be a low category second world country though. Why was the current Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, banned from the US and the UK until he was elected? Oh, uh, he was the chief minister of Gujarat where a genocide of Muslim ha Muslims happened. About 2,000 of them were killed, raped, uh, mutilated uh, in, in the time of his uh, rule, rule. Uh, and apparently he did nothing or very likely encouraged that to happen. Do you think, and you can answer this one as, as long as you want, it's complicated. Do you think that Hong Kong should allow itself to be enveloped by mainland China, including all of all of its uh, mainland China's laws without any more protesting? 
Uh, well, uh, uh, my view has been that uh, Hong Kong should have become independent. Taiwan should have become officially independent 30, 40, 50 years back when China was much weaker. Western countries did not take the initiative to uh, recognize Taiwan as a separate country in 1970s or 1980s. They waited until now to agitate those people. Uh, The problem with Hong Kong and Taiwan today is that the more you agitate the local population to claim that they are independent, the more agitated China will become. Uh, Because if you have a democratic movement happening in Hong Kong, uh, if China does not control that, then China will become destabilized. So I think if I were in Xi's position, I would do exactly what he's doing currently as far as Hong Kong and Taiwan is concerned, even if I wanted Taiwan and Hong Kong to stay independent. I think agitations, democratic agitations in Hong Kong were very erroneous. Hong Kong was a much more free country, and the more they agitated, the worse the, situ- the the freedoms of Hong Kong and Hong Kongers became. Now, I increasingly hear that people are returning back to Hong Kong because apart from certain uh, constraints imposed by China, Hong Kong continues to be a very free place. Uh, they allowed, uh, China allowed a lot of democratic movements ha- to continue over almost 10 years. And I have witnessed uh, scores of those. They, uh, I was actually standing right below the Chinese flag when uh, people removed it and desecrated it. And China accepted until that point of time. So uh, I, I think... Uh, American attempt to agitate people of Hong Kong, Hong Kong and Taiwan isn't helping those people. Just stop talking about it and China will very likely be fine with those countries' existence the way they are today. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting point. And Hong Kong is certainly fighting against inevitability. So that is something to consider in all of that. Uh, just one practical question for you. Uh, giant. You visit and have visited a lot of dangerous places, uh, black markets on the street. Uh, How does one go about that safely? And what's the best way to get your currency converted on the street? Uh, well, uh, you, uh, you 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 have to uh, uh, make sure that you convert a small amount of money. You talk with a lot of people on the street, uh, but more importantly, you should look cheap. You should uh, dress up as a poor person. You don't want to be too friendly with the local people because uh, all the third world countries, uh, friendliness often equates with being weak and being submissive, uh, and that is exactly why. Uh, uh, Gabriel, when I go to India or uh, several sub-Saharan African countries, I have to tell myself not to use thank you or please or smile too much because those things will work against you. So you you have to behave like a local and then look for uh, currency currency conversions on the street that way. Uh, and uh, you have to be reasonably confident that you are not going to get counterfeit currency when you exchange. Okay, so so final question here, Janet. You have <clears throat> indicated that you're you're interested in uh, writing a book. So you're working on a book. Uh, what's going on with that? Well, I'm just about to start writing a book. Uh, I'm, I've been encouraged by my mentor, Doug Casey, to write it. Uh, I think uh, a lot of wisdom about the third world has been lost uh, in the Western society, and I think it is extremely important to bring that understanding back to the West. Now, that understanding won't come because every cycle that has started must get completed before uh, anything changes. So the Western society will probably destroy itself because of its lack of understanding of the people of the third world. Uh, but I still want to document it for the people who want to, uh, to, to read it and understand what is happening uh, in, in the world. Well, I, I hope to see it on, on bookshelves soon and on Oprah's list and uh, uh, on all the bestseller lists. Um, unlikely to happen because of how truthful you are. But uh, Mr. Bandari, thank you again for your time. Um, and we will provide all the links to your various sources. So thank you again for joining the show. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Gabriel.